So I'm pleased to be here uh, representing Mapillary. I want to talk about island mapping. It's going to be a bit of a visual journey. Uh, how many people here today are from an island country or live on an island or, or work on an island? So, Australia is too big. New Zealand's about right, though. <laughs> so it's a pretty high number. Uh, I'm from Montana in the US, so I'm not from an island. Uh, and I've actually never been to Oceania before, but I have been to quite a few islands across the world and done some mapping projects there. So I want to share some of the experiences I've had, uh, especially in a visual way, and see uh, what it might inspire the rest of us to do when you go back home after this conference. So I want to talk about uh, these physical aspects of mapping, which is things like connectivity, infrastructure, urbanization but also things that are rather intangible, uh, community, uh, community, participation, and collaboration. There's several tools uh, that I was using in what we'll look at in the visualizations here. Um, just really quick, it's the tools that MapLayer provides, such as our APIs, our open source uh, GIS, I'm uh, oh, sorry, open source viewer, JS, the overpass API from OSM, uh, some boundaries from who's on first, OSMNX to get uh, networks, and QGIS to work with all that data. I also thought this quote gave uh, a great example of why I want to look at islands. Something as small as an island uh, is really great to study, especially as far as mapping it to completion or mapping uh, both what's there as well as the people who live there. And it helps us understand the greater world at large. A little about Mapillary. Uh, Mapillary is a platform that allows you to upload images and create street level imagery. It's not a model in the way that many maps are, but rather gives a snapshot of reality on the ground. So we'll actually take the images that you upload and the, we're able to extract data from them. Things like traffic signs or road assets, crosswalks, benches. And Making MapLayer work really well involves mapping all the roads. You have to be comprehensive. But because of this, it's also participatory by nature. We need someone who is actually out there on the roads, on the trails, uh, on the beaches, wherever it might be that you can bring a camera, and snapping photos of that in order to visualize it and bring it back into a mapping context. It works with any camera anywhere. It ranges from phones to action cameras all the way up to any type of 360 camera you can put on a vehicle. So let's take a journey. First, I want to talk about island biogeography. So I mentioned that studying an island is really great for understanding the, the larger context of the world. And we think about a place like the Galapagos Islands for this, which was famous uh, for biology, for studying how species uh, thrive, survive, and evolve, especially in isolation. And you also see different constraints, even among people who live there, about things uh, such as migration, uh, emigration, the constraints of size and limited space, influence from the mainland, as well as a transforming environment, uh, whether it's humans changing it or animal species or plant species. So I want to think about these uh, older concepts, but in terms of humans and cities and urbanization on islands. When I first started with MapLayer around three years ago, one of the first projects I had the opportunity to work on uh, involved mapping Santa Catalina Island, which is right off the coast of Los Angeles and California. So on the left side, you can see some of the issues this island would face. Uh, and many of them might sound very familiar to you. Fresh water is scarce. Uh, there's a lot of endemic species. It's important to preserve them. They don't exist on the mainland. Uh, there's many artifacts of native cultures that were there hundreds and thousands of years ago. There's congestion of traffic. Locals can only own cars. Tourists have to drive golf carts around. Uh, and you have just one small town on that island that is very easy to map in detail if you put the effort in. And you'll see on the right the timeline. Uh, and again, it might look very familiar. The island was settled thousands of years ago by Native Americans, but it was later colonized. Uh, as we get closer to the modern day, most of the natives are entirely gone. The land was privatized. A lot of it's now in nature conservancy. Uh, it was ravaged by grass fires. And finally, we went there to try to map it. After all of this history, it already transformed it from what it might have been 500 years ago. 
So we went there and set up base in the fire station and with the group of MapTime LA, we were able to go out and capture street level images as well as collect a lot of data like uh, addresses on houses and points of interest. So just a quick look at uh, the town of Avalon that's on this island. We were able to capture most of the center of it as well as the surrounding roads, but it's a very limited area. And once we captured the street level imagery, Mapillary also classifies every pixel in the images as belonging to some category. So you can see things like vegetation, buildings, pedestrian areas. So we'll take a look at how this can be helpful later beyond just using the images as a reference. I mentioned already the Galapagos Islands. Uh, these are very unique uh, compared to many others that we might talk about because they have no indigenous humans. Um, fascinating for the species there, but today humans are not only there studying uh, biology, but there's a tourism explosion. And because of that, there are many people who come to work on the island. So housing needs to be built. There are restaurants, there are hotels, roads, but you also need food. It's surprising how much of the land on a place that's supposed to be a very natural paradise is dedicated to farming and pasture. And again, fresh water is very scarce. So many of these might sound like familiar problems. So a team from the University of Chicago and Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation, uh, for this year, the second year in a row, they went in this, um, around June and July to go map the island with 360 cameras. So they would mount the camera on top of a bicycle helmet and ride a bicycle around all the roads that were accessible on two different islands. And one of the students, Ryan Cutter, he was able to take some of the data that Mapillary extracted from those images and split it into categories such as urban, natural, or other along all the roads and be able to kind of measure an urban density from this. So we'll take a look at that. The Faroe Islands are another important one for Mapillary. Uh, you can see here the capital is a small dot of light uh, with some nighttime imagery. So small that you probably can't see it actually. Uh, this is an interesting island because it has a lot of influence from the mainland in Europe, but it's kind of out on its own in the Atlantic. Uh, it's very autonomous, but the Danish government uh, generally provides most of the funding for the infrastructure and has a lot of political influence. And there's a bit of tension around that. There's a lot of tourism, there's a lot of sheep, uh, but there's also something that popped up called Sheep View. Uh, the locals there made a petition to Google. They said, we want Street View. We want it for uh, all sorts of reasons. People want to just see what's on the map. It can be useful for tools, for tourism. And so they actually put a camera on top of a sheep and started having it run around the island uh, mapping places. And this garnered a lot of attention in the media. So eventually Google came, but it took many years. But in between that time, around 2016, one of our founders he traveled with his son, spent a week in the Faroe Islands, uh, had cameras all over his car, duct taped to the top, hanging off the side, and mapped quite a few roads on the island. And then a few of us from Mapillary actually returned uh, this spring and filled in some of the gaps. So you can see we uh, have the 2016 imagery. It's in green, covering quite a few of the roads. And it's a little more comprehensive by 2019. And this uh, made the local news there as just probably one of the more exciting things that was going on that week. Uh, but it also means there's a lot more imagery on the ground that people can use to extract uh, a lot of detailed features and enrich the map. Uh, so here's just an idea of what it looks like in the Faroe Islands or driving around. And then you can also see with the color coding what it looks like when the machine learning is able to analyze it. <coughs> Hawaii is another great example of an island that faces a lot of common island problems. Uh, and has uh, a very rich history that uh, still endures today into its issues. Originally, as the Kingdom of Hawaii, uh, as annexed by the United States. Today, uh, it's part of the United States, a US state. It has very few images. It's rather well mapped on OpenStreetMap. It's usable. Um, but once you get there, you're using the map to get around. You can see there's a lot of inequality in how the infrastructure is distributed. There's quite a bit of uh, cultural tension between people who are native to Hawaii and people who came from outside, whether from North America, from Asia, uh, many places. There's a huge amount of tourism running the economy, uh, but there's also a lot of environmental damage. Some of it's from invasive species, some of it's from human developments. So here's just an example of a more rural part of Hawaii. Uh, 
has pretty well paved roads, but you can see also there's a lot of vegetation, there's a lot of just the natural world mixed in with where people are living in these areas. Whereas you may go to an urban area in Honolulu, and you can see they have skyscrapers, a lot of tree cover, but once you're underneath the trees at the street level, you can also see there's a lot more that might be relevant to a detailed map. Uh, there's things like whether or not there's sidewalks, benches, trash bins, a lot that's hidden under the tree cover you might not see from an aerial view. Hawaii has quite a few roads on several of its islands, but on the island of Oahu, you have also a few federal roads. So these are built and maintained by the government um, based in Washington, D.C. And if you look at them closely, you can see that they're actually coincide very well with where the military areas are on this island, uh, as well as the city of Honolulu. And it's kind of clear that these roads, which are the nicest ones by far in the entire state, were built to make sure that military traffic can get from an Air Force base to a Navy base to an Army base to a Marine base. So you really ask, like, who does this infrastructure benefit? And who's kind of left out because they don't live near it? Or who's forced to live near it in order to make life work? So here you can see a very beautiful part of this highway. And it even cuts through a tunnel that allows people to get across the island much more quickly. So many islands have a common problem that it takes a long time to get somewhere. And many of the roads are clustered around the coasts. It takes a lot of money to put something in like this. Another contentious point on the Hawaiian Islands was the, um, especially a lot in the news this year, there's a, a telescope and astronomical facility on top of Mauna Kea, uh, which is one of the tallest mountains on the main island of Hawaii. And there was plans to actually expand it. Um, I forget how much exactly, but several times larger than it currently is. And so you can see on the imagery on the left here, many native Hawaiians, many locals in support, all lined up to protest this. Uh, they blocked off the access road that leads up the mountain. Uh, only the employees were allowed to go up, but tourism there stopped. And it had a very effective message. People were very aware of how important this issue was there. Um, but it shows a tension between what's culturally important, what's spiritually important to people who live there, and other goals like saying that we absolutely need an observatory on this because it's such a, a prime location for it. It's a great question of what gets prioritized and who has a stake in deciding how to do it. Uh, so just to look there where the, the observatory is in the middle of the island where the yellow marker is. And this road that connects the east and west coast of it also was a very important piece of infrastructure, but um, tended to coincide with making sure that that observatory had access to the coasts. Um, otherwise, for years before that, people were going all the way around the island or taking a very rough interior road to get across it. Another great example is Sicily. Uh, this one also has been colonized throughout history. Most people who were indigenous Sicilians are long absorbed into different populations. Uh, it was colonized by Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Norman Vikings. Uh, and today it's part of Italy. But this is kind of contentious as well. Uh, it's famous, of course. We know many movies that reference Sicilian mafia. But there's a lot of corruption on the island. A lot of money is unaccounted for as soon as it comes in from the mainland. Unemployment's very high, especially among the youth. There's a lot of decay in the infrastructure. A lot of migration coming up from Africa across the Mediterranean into Europe. But it's also very popular for tourism. So there's a lot of strain on this place. Uh, driving around there mapping, I spotted this graffiti uh, more than one time saying Sicily is not Italy. And most people don't think of it that way unless you really understand the differences between Sicilians and everyone that they're connected to on the mainland. But in a place like this also, you see that the rampant corruption can lead to poor accountability. So a lot of money goes into the island to help with services like waste management. Yet driving on a, a back road away from the coast, you'll happen upon a scene like this where trash just lines the roads. And it shows that a lot of the money just gets pocketed by someone. The trash gets thrown here rather than disposed of properly. And it's just a challenge to fix that somehow. There's also limited space. so. All this will build up over years and over years, and it has nowhere to go. So this is an example of something you can map also. Uh, it's out of, sight, out of mind when it's on these back roads. It's near an abandoned railway station. 
but you can map it as uh, land use landfill with informal yes, something we've seen other projects uh, in Africa, for example, mapping. And once it's on the map, you bring that issue forward. It brings it into our minds. Uh, finally, another one is, is Zanzibar, which is a great example of community and participatory mapping. There's multiple islands in the archipelago. Uh, there's a lot of drone mapping that's going on there. Uh, there's a Zanzibar Mapping Institute. Uh, and there's a lot of activity between international groups uh, as well as local groups like the university who are sharing knowledge and collaborating to go ahead and map all the infrastructure as well as just build better data to support response to, uh, to weather events like rainfall, flooding, and drought, as well as to help with planning and urbanization. So it has beautiful drone imagery uh, that's very effective for mapping things on OpenStreetMap uh, from an aerial view. And the project continued over uh, quite a while with a grid-based system uh, that you'll see in things like the tasking managers for OSM and really effectively map the whole thing. We went there uh, with several cameras and we tried to map the old city, which was a lot of struggle because of GPS problems. Uh, but we also passed on some of the technology and the knowledge, left cameras there for uh, local geospatial students to use. And we've seen that get used after we left uh, as an effective way to help map the island. So overall with urbanization, I mean, traditionally we look at it from a, a bird's eye view and we see urbanization is, uh, is easily detected from satellite imagery. You can look at it from nighttime imagery, but it's often not participatory. It's done not just from far away, but from space, uh, from people that have access to data that locals don't. So I want to look at just other ways we can measure these urban footprints. And uh, you can see on the right side the type of things that Mapillary can detect, and on the left what it looks like. And in QGS, you can pull these in. Uh, just an example is you can make cells over an area. You can classify the density of those things we detect in those cells. Um, and then you'll end up with, let's see if I froze there. You can do things like show the density of urban versus natural features. So here's Catalina Island, the Galapagos Islands. And you can see how the more central port areas are actually that lighter color, which means more urban density. And finally, the Faroe Islands, uh, the capital city of Torshav in there. Again, you can see it's very urban. It's very developed. There's a lot of sidewalks. There's a lot of power lines, uh, which is a lot different from a place like the Galapagos, where the built-up areas with roads are actually not that built up once you get away from the water. Uh, and finally, another example from Réunion, uh, Saint Denis. So overall, with mapping an island, it's very important that we have local information. That's what makes things accurate, but also meaningful. And we really highly depend on local mapathons, local data collection, taking your own pictures, going out with your own device, and mapping what's important to you. Having the infrastructure on the map is definitely important as well for understanding the physical geography, uh, but it's not the whole. We need to know about the people who live there. We need to know what matters to them. And having a local participation in that mapping is really what brings it alive. Uh, in OpenStreetMap, I just want to point out that we now uh, give back data on request if you're capturing mapillary images. So it's a great way to go out with a camera, capture your own photos locally, uh, send us a message, and then we send back a lot of these map features, uh, which is activated as a layer in OpenStreetMap. Uh, so you'll see it on the data layers in the ID editor. It's live now. And overall, I just want to say that a lot of these things are tools, but it's the people who are able to take them and carry out a mission. So I ask people to think about what tools you can provide to your community. Think about what issues need documenting. And as a local mapper, think about how you can not just show a static map, but things like change, growth, and decay. So I encourage you to get involved with Mapillary, get involved with OpenStreetMap, uh, and raise a community, really build one, to go out and build your own local map of your island. Uh, so thanks very much for attending. Uh, I just want to announce too, we're giving away a camera. If you can find the image somewhere in Oceania on Mapler's website that has this comment. Uh, there is an island that comes up somewhere. Um, uh, I guess I might have lost it. So it might not have made it into my presentation, but there's an island in Oceania that uh, contains this image. And 
if you find it, come let us know, and you'll be the lucky winner. But thanks a lot, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think we got about three minutes for questions. Kia ora. Um, I was just wondering if you, if um, what's your and take on having the cultural landscape included into these sorts of projects um, to inform not just the communities but the professionals that are doing the work so that we could make more informed decisions. Yeah, I think the, the idea behind this is really making sure the tool is, is neutral so that people can use it to serve their own purposes. So I think that's a very great idea. Uh, OpenStreetMap can sometimes um, have difficulties with how to properly classify these sorts of things. So I know that's an issue, and sometimes that means you need to just create your own map. Uh, so with Mapillary, we're supportive of using it outside of OpenStreetMap as well. You can use QGIS, you can use your own tools. And I really hope to see it be helpful to people who want to actually show a different perspective uh, than just a very traditional map. Thank you. I like your comments about the urbanization, how, how your data can sort of reflect that. I'm wondering what is the, how do we measure urbanization? Is it where people do stuff or where people live? And, and how that relates to what we then want to mine out of those data. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, I, I've seen the port wasn't classified as urbanized because that's where not urban activity happens, but, or a few people only are active there. I don't know if you have any comment on that. Yeah, it's, it's very broad right now, which is unfortunate. Um, it's just a very new concept. So we're kind of aggregating different categories like power line groups, sidewalks, all these as urban features. So there's not really any weight to that density. And I'd hope to see in some future projects I'm working on with different students across the world is seeing if we can make it more fine-grained. So people want to look for specific things like um, we classify shop signs and advertisements so it can be more of a commercial area. Uh, we also want to see if we can do some machine learning on uh, land use parcels in order to do a, a training data set and then go to another city and see if we can actually predict what the land use is, whether it's residential or commercial or industrial, just based on the ground level imagery. So it's very early for this, but uh, there's a lot to be done in the future for sure.